What's going on Official Nation? I'm here to set up a 32 gallon bio cube here today for one of our clients in the store. Um, she is pretty much gonna let me set it up exactly the way that I set mine up. I'm um, gonna post up some pictures here and then I will show you all the products that, that I use personally in mine. And then honestly, most of those products are stuff that we use on all of our maintenance clients and things like that too. So I do use these products, just like I said in the plan and setup video that I'm not telling you about stuff that I don't know anything about. If I've never used it, I pretty much don't tell you to use it. I'll warn you, hey, I haven't used this thing. Go ahead and try and tell me what you think about it. And I am willing to try new things, but this is what I know works because as you can see from my photos, it's, uh, it 100% works. So if you set up your bio cube exactly this way, then you're gonna be successful. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is put in our sand. So what we use is about 22 pounds, give or take, of aragonite. It's a carob sea sand. It's not too fine, it's not too coarse. A lot of people like to think they're gonna use sugar sand, because they want it to be like, some image in they have in they have in their head of like beach sand or something which is not sugar sand if a fish swims over that if the pump moves around at more than 100 gallons an hour you're going to have a permanently cloudy sandy tank so you don't you don't want to use sugar sand in your tank um the top that's going to be our bottom layer of soil of substrate our top layer is going to be pink fiji which is also a carob sea sand and that is live sand. So you want your live sand to go on top. You don't need to have it super thick. It's a 10 pound bag, that'll be fine. And then it comes with some clarifier too, which most of the time we don't need to use the way that we fill these things. But in the event that you poured yours in and it got super crazy cloudy, then you can just use the little clarifier pack that they send. And within a couple hours, your tank is clear. So let's go ahead and pour the sand in there. Okay, now that we have our sand in our tank, we're gonna go ahead and stack our rock. So, a lot of people will call in and say like, hey, I need some dry rock. Do you guys sell dry rock? Well, we do. For our store, we have a rock tank in the back that sits with a cover over it in complete darkness. And so when we take in trade or we break down a tank, all the rock goes in there for three months. So the worst, even if you get rock out of our coral rack in the front and sump, the worst thing you're gonna get out of there is bristle worm. And you're gonna get bristle worms they start out incredibly tiny. You're gonna get them when you buy a coral from somewhere, or you're gonna pour a little bit of water from a fish that you bought from the internet or from some store in there. You're gonna end up with those anyway. Or maybe it's, you know, an Aptasia is gonna get in there on the bottom side of a coral that you buy. So by buying dry rock, not only are you gonna force yourself into an algae situation that's annoying and very difficult to get rid of, and it takes many months, you're also, you don't have, it's not cured, so, you're not getting beneficial bacteria out of it right out the gate. You have to build that up also, so you have longer cycle time. And then on top of that, when that's all said and done, you're still gonna wind up with some pests in your tank. So the best way to combat pests is to use animals that eat those pests and not worry about it. If you wanna go ahead and skip all those headaches that I already talked about, just buy some live rock from a store, from a reputable dealer, or from a buddy down the street who has extra live rock or something. So the thing to think about when you set up your live rock is think about caves. The best way I can say is try, try to be creative to the best of your ability. Once you build rock a specific way and you have to tear it down to like move your tank or catch a fish, it's never going to go back exactly the same way. So try to avoid expectations of, well, my rock will look exactly like this whenever I move my tank. That's not going to happen. Just each time is a new build. Save your corals, make sure they're safe if you move. But when you put your rock together, just think about building caves, build plenty of ways for water flow to get through that, that structure. Because if your flow can't get through it, you're gonna have dead spots inside that rock where waste builds up, and then your nitrates go up, and then maybe you have ammonia spikes in the future or something. It's just a, that's a bad way to, or that's a straight way to get to a problem is it's, if you want to just build all your rock into a giant ball, you don't want it to look like just a pile of rubble, like someone just brought in rock and poured it into your tank. Give it some structure, give it some height. I try to build it in kind of this manner. So it looks like, you know, a sloping of a cliff. If you want to build it to the back wall and have it look like it's sloped off the back wall, or you want to build an island right in the center, either way, 
leave a little bit of room, you know, an inch or, an inch or two of room on the side, because you're going to have a scraper, you're going to want to get in there and clean the glass. If you build all your rock up against all those things, first time you go in there, try and scrape some coralline algae off the glass, or get rid of, grab a pest star or something, you're going to knock your whole structure over, or you're not going to be able to clean that spot, it's going to be incredibly annoying. So, just get ahead of that by leaving an inch or two on all, on all sides of the glass. Not only is that going to improve your flow all the way around, but it's going to help you clean it later. So let's get into just trying to stack this random rock that I brought in a way that makes it look like I didn't just pour it into the tank. That did not break. So one thing I forgot to mention is that on your live rock and your sand, you want to have one pound per gallon. So that's this is a 32.5 pounds, so it's like just over on the pounds per gallon. Um, if you use much more, as you can tell, you're going to be just way too. You're going to have way too much. It's going to be very apparent that you have like a way too much rock. If you have even one of these rocks less, so if you have like 25 pounds it's definitely gonna look like not enough. So for your filtration needs, you wanna have one pound per gallon. That's just the route that we always go. And then you, you don't have any problems in the future one way or the other. Hey, my filtration's not strong enough, or hey, my flow is not strong enough. So it gives you a good meeting. And just like with planet tanks and your substrate depth need, you we say one pound per gallon, but if you have some kind of goofy pillar tank that's like, uh, 12 inch pillar that happens to be the whole size of your your ceiling then obviously you're not going to want to have a hundred pounds of sand this thick in the bottom then you're going to cause methane issues and and it's not going to get dredged enough that that's going to be a problem for you so you're still going to look for like two inches of sand it's just that's a general rule for a normal aquarium there's always going to be somebody who says well, I have this goofy farm. If I did one pound per gallon, it's a, I, I get it. There's always exceptions to the rule. But this is our general rule for setting up farms. Okay, so now we're going to build our filtration, which, and this is a bio cube, but the, the all-in-one filters like this, they work like a sump, but it's in the back of your tank. So normally on a, on a saltwater aquarium, you have an overflow. So you have the vents up here and your water is pushed in from your return pump basically constantly creating an overflow too much water so these vents the water will flow down the vents it'll go down a hose into a, another glass box called a sump where your water then goes through a series of channels that forces the water to go through back to the pump to be pushed back into the tank so this is going to work just the same except for Rather than it go down and go through filtration, it's just gonna pull in from this right side. It's forced to go up, down through the filtration in the center, then underneath and back into the chamber with the return pump. So that return chamber, that's where you wanna check your water level because it will keep your, that return chamber will keep every other chamber in this thing full except for that return chamber. As when it gets down, if you let it drain down, not only are you increasing your salinity, but you are um, making your waste have less water to be in. So a lot, of, a lot of times people with a tank that has not enough water or they've evaporated a lot, their nitrates will read higher than if it was full because you're testing the same amount of nitrate, it doesn't evaporate. 
as well as your, your salinity is obviously going to be higher. So that leads me into one other thing. I oftentimes have people that I know come into the store that just set up a brand new tank and they ask me for a jug of salt water. And before I check them out, I ask them, so are you doing a water change already? And nine times out of ten they go, no, my water's evaporated, I need to add water to it. So you don't add salt water for evaporation. Salt does not evaporate, so it's still, it is still going to be the same in the, in the water. The salt that's in there is going to be the same no matter how much water is left. That's why when you have creep like bubbles popping out of the wall, once the water evaporates, you'll see a bubble of salt there because the salt isn't going anywhere. So the more that your water evaporates, the higher your salt content goes up. So we generally look for 1.024, um, generally the standard is 1.026, but we find that with maintenance, if you're at 1.024, that's a good salinity to be at, you can go down two points or up two points and still be safe. If you start at 2.6, and especially for an, a new beginner, you start at 2.6, if you let it get to 2.8, that's bad, real bad news. So we give yourself a little bit of a buffer later on down the line when you have a much larger, a larger tank with a sump filtration and an ATO, something that it's an automatic top off, it will add water back to this and you can more keep it at 2.6 constantly. But for somebody that has to add water to their aquarium because they don't have an ATO, 2.4 is a pretty good place to be. So that's what our water is going to be today. I was like, somewhere I was going with this. Yeah, I've heard add distilled water because it's So we don't, we generally don't, you can use that, but we generally don't use distilled because there's no elements in there. So it's literally just water. Whereas when you... Water evaporates, it's just water. Right, exactly. It is distilled So, if you use just if you use that, you're constantly diminishing your your element ratio. Whereas if you buy RO that's remineralized, it has minerals in it but no salt. Oh, okay. So your pH is gonna not have as good a buffering means. Oh, okay. So oftentimes what we see is people who use distilled water, their pH constantly they're having a problem with it. Why is it 7.6 when it should be 8.2? And then we eventually get down to, oh, you're just buying jugs of Dasani and pouring it in there, and you're, you're not adding it back. Whereas people that are using RO that's been remineralized, that's an important part. If you buy RO that's not remineralized, it's just like buying just the water it's the same. So we use a remineralizer um, from Brightwell, and it puts all that stuff back that's taken out by the filtration process. Mm -hmm. And I can just get that for you guys. Yeah. Um, and how do I check the salinity? I mean, I could buy a salinity here, or in the meantime, can I just let like, bring the sample? Yeah, so you can bring your um, you bring your water in. We can test your calcium, magnesium, alkalinity, phosphate, all that stuff. Your salinity, nitrates, nitrate ammonia. So probably after seven days of setting this up, bring me a water sample and we'll check it and see how things are going. If you have ammonia, we'll be like, okay, something happened wrong and we'll get it worked out. If everything's gravy, you know, then we'll put some cleanup crew in there, and then mm -hmm. a week later you can add but a fish or a coral or something. But there's nothing to clean up if there's no cleanup or there's cleanup crew. There is, you're going to have to be running the light and dosing, mm -hmm. and there's going to be algae that is in here. Okay. Not to mention just like any of this other impurity stuff that's still on the rock that's dead, mm -hmm. it will, they'll eat that. So you don't need to go crazy. We recommend a third of your cleanup crew. So if you need, 32 hermit crabs, get 10 of them. And then you need 10 astrea snails, get get three or four. So you're you're not putting your whole peanut crew in there at once to starve them all. And kind of like everything else I said, I know that that works because I do it all the time. Like with maintenance clients, when they purchase a brand new aquarium and we go set it up for them, that's exactly what we do. And their cleanup crew generally lasts for roughly nine months. That's what we say. You need to replace 70% of it every nine months because the crabs are going to need a bigger shell and they eat a snail or, you know, the crabs fight and they kill each other once in a while or just, you know, the, a, a, a fish you threw in there eats some of them. Your cleanup crew is going to constantly need a little bit of replenishing, but if you start in that like one third every two weeks to a month, so within three months max, you're going to have your entire cleanup crew. And there should be 
plenty of stuff for them to be eating. If after two weeks, you'll notice that one, the glass is already going to have some algae. Your rock is already going to have like the beginnings of some either green or brown or just like detritus type stuff build up in there. I mean, this is live rock, so it's probably got some coke pods in there and they'll be in there doing stuff, but definitely adds a pretty quick. Like, pretty quick. This is the basket that comes with the um, with the bio cube. So when they send it, it's like this. Um, which, if you're gonna use it in their in in their configuration, then by all means you can. That's gonna limit you from doing the way that I quote unquote hot rod, as people say, the filtration process, which is to use it in this way. So my once again, I'll with the pictures of my aquarium, this is how I have mine set up. So I know there's more than one way to skin a cat, but I like to fill this entire chamber with floss, basically. So floss is cheap and it's a huge area for you to catch as much large particle waste as possible in here. And then in the bottom rows, I will put a, P a Purigen and a poly filter and then a layer of floss. So, and then I'll do that on the bottom also. So that gives me two small bags of Purigen, one piece of poly filter that I've cut in half, split between the two, and then a little more floss. So this is just entirely floss, and then on top of that, this sits, and I will put a bag of carbon on the, just on the top there, so that when the water overflows, it pours onto the carbon and goes through. So I know some people don't like just carbon, okay, so just don't use it. Um, I haven't had yet had a problem with it, I don't have tangs or anything, so I don't generally worry about like lateral line or some people say carbon cause lateral line for tangs. You're not, you shouldn't be putting a tang in this tank anyway, so please don't do that. But this is just, I'm showing you the way that I have mine set up and you can see the success of my tank and others that I have built like it. And then you can make your own choice from there. So actually the first thing I do is this side of the tank here where your water actually comes in, the first thing it's gonna do is go through here. So I put, a sponge over this whole first half of this entire in this entire filtration so it has otherwise your only sponge in here is going to be the little piece of sponge that stops sand and particles going into the pump chamber at the bottom so I, in my mind that's not enough i like to have more filtration more bacteria than that so i will put a sponge here so we'll go ahead and do that so the actual sponges that we're going to use today are trigger foam sponges. Ideally, we like to use eShop's foam sponges, which are a block, but right now with the current situation with shipping and manufacturing the way that it is due to the crisis, we don't have access to the eShop sponges at this time. So we're going to make do by using two of these uh, and just putting this uh, a light zip tie that's to hold them together so they don't just for ease of use, you don't have to do that, but we're gonna cut these into pieces and then fit them over here. So here's our basket. This is exactly what mine looks like on my tank in the store, that one I showed you earlier in the video. Um, the I have the sponge, it goes all the way down this side, and then I have a bunch of floss up here and floss and poly filter in here. I did not have another Purigen, otherwise normally there'd be another Purigen in here and then poly filter, purigen, and floss. And that's just the way that I, I have it in my tank and it works awesome. So all this catches all that particle matter. So whether you do your water change every two weeks or every month, when you replace the stuff, you're taking out large particulate, a lot of it. You don't have to worry about it breaking down, getting very much through here. I mean, so this catches it when it's very large. By the time you get to your poly filter, the poly filter is gonna keep everything else. If you're leaving your media in here long enough that it's going to break down past the micron of a fault poly filter, then you have bigger problems. Like you need to be doing changes of your media more often. So uh, this pretty much will stop all of your any particulate matter getting to your pump. So it should be very very clean water when it comes up the other side of this mess. So you can see there is a filter. Uh, it might be a little dark, but there's a filter down there. That's what stops this chamber from anything from getting from this chamber over into that chamber. This is your large chamber. This is where you put your heater, because this chamber is going to stay full all the time. Don't put your heater over in the 
pump chamber because when the water goes out of there, you're gonna overheat. This is also where you put your skimmer if you have one. The new BioCube skimmer is, is actually pretty good. I just got one. Prior to that, I didn't believe in it because those were crap. So the air-driven ones suck. The pump-driven ones are pretty good. It seems to actually be working in skimming now instead of just making a cup full of water. But as you can see, with one hand, I just placed that in there. So my filter media is good to go. That's all tip. So it's not overpacked. It still is going to allow pretty decent flow, but the water's going to have to go through the majority of that. It's going to overflow from here into there. So that's why uh, I still I still put this in here, and we're going to use her BioCube filter for this setup because I mean it came with the BioCube, so she paid for it, and it's got carbon in it. So we're not going to have to. Uh, put a media bag with carbon in there right now, but normally I just have a media bag that I fill full of carbon and I put it in here. So the water flows onto the carbon and then down on there. So what, we're going to rinse this thing first, but it literally just sits down inside that, like that. I mean, if you really want to use the bio cartridge, the BioCube cartridges, I mean, I think that you are, it's just a little bit of floss and some carbon. It's uh, sorry, BioCube, but it's pretty much wasting money. So we're going to use it for this first one, and then she's going to ditch it and go to a media bag with some carbon. And then you can buy a uh, glass quad, like from us, you can buy a, a whole 16 ounces of carbon for, you know, a, a few bucks, as opposed to you're going to spend $3 on this thing, and you have to buy it every single time. That one 16 ounce of carbon in this tank is going to last you for like four water changes or better. So. It's a much better deal. So we have our heater here. It's a, an Eheim Thermo Control 100. That is the appropriate size for this tank. I'll post pictures of uh, all of those heaters probably right now, but um, I don't worry about using the heater holder in here because you're gonna have, if you decide you're gonna run if you're gonna put a bio block down in here, which is one, one thing I don't have today, but I suggest you put some kind of bio block in this chamber, then and then you're gonna have potentially a skimmer and a, and you got a pump on the side here that can jam things up using that heater holder. And you're this thing isn't in danger of fish running into it or anything. So I just gently place it down there, let it be where it's gonna be, and then you can close your lid. And you don't have to worry about it. Our uh, circulation pump that we're going to use is this high door. I used two of these for mine um, originally. That's what. Uh, so when I bought mine, it was originally a used tank, and it came with two of these. So I used these for a long time. They're good uh, circulation pumps. They're just plug and play, though. Um, currently, high door has come out with the Aquamai. That's what I call it. I'm, I think I'm pretty sure that's how it goes, but. The Aquamize are Wi-Fi controlled and they can be set up through an app to run like I have my left one going at 60% and my right one goes at 40 and then every hour they switch back and forth. So you get flow, you get, you lose dead spots that way. You don't have to worry about, oh, well, this spot over here doesn't get enough circulation because you're constantly changing that. So that's a, another way to go if you don't require uh, a lot of flow or changing flow, then you can go ahead and just get a standard pump like this that worked fine for a really long time. So I wouldn't dog it and say, ah, that, that, that doesn't work, it's not gonna work, use something else. Uh, any, you know, 500 gallon, if you're gonna use anything lower than that, I would use two, maybe two, 300 gallon per hour, something to that effect. But these are uh, really good pumps for what we're trying to use them for. So it just has a magnet on the back side. It holds it in place. The magnet is the same on both sides, so it doesn't matter what side you connect it on. And then it'll just swivel around on the, the little ball back there. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So in these tanks, if you're just only going to have low flow coral and you're going to do water changes every two weeks and make sure you take care of your tank properly, then this is going to be fine. You're going to have your um, pump kind of go up 
towards the top of the water and flow this direction and then you want your pump to kind of blow across in this direction that will kind of create your cross flow and that would be fine so now i guess we're at the point of adding some water to this thing turning it all on and then we'll set the timer on this light talk about some other light options and then we will be done so i actually personally i use a colander for this a lot of people you will use a plate or a bowl um, or, you know, they just throw caution to the wind and just pour their water in and it, it's an absolute mess for the rest of the day. But I like to add the water into a colander because it makes it rain in there and you will see there is very little, especially with the wet sand on top of it already, there's very little issue with having messy water after. Okay, so now we're going to set the light on this aquarium. The BioCube light is uh, pretty rudimentary. It has blue and then like a dull colored white, and then it has a very bright white light. Um, we generally say that you should only have your light on for eight hours a day. Now I will ramp the blue light a little before after that. On hers, I think we're going to do from like four in the afternoon to midnight is going to be the total light cycle. Our other lights that we use are AI Primes. Um, they're the same ones that I use in the planet setup and all, almost all of our tanks run off of those. So these lights actually do pretty good as you'll see from my personal cube again. So the other lights that we use are AI Primes. They're HDs, the, the new ones that came out are 2020s or HD 16s, something like that. But the, a lot oftentimes people will take this light out and they'll cut a hole in the lid and they'll put an AI light on top, on top of there. If you have an old bio cube, if that's you know buying or, or a, one without a light, then that's definitely the direction that I suggest that you go. You get best bang for your buck when it comes to UI and the app, the controllability of the thing, and then just the overall power of the light that you're getting. Um, if you buy, you can buy a more expensive light that, like a Radeon, that may be an awesome light but you're losing some controllability, plus you're paying a lot more for that light. So all of our tanks that we run, run AIs, and that seems to be the most value that we can get for our dollar. If you are gonna uh, modify a bio cube, you can either remove the entire lid altogether and just put a light, hang a light over top of it, or go ahead and remove your light fixture from this lid and cut a hole in the lid and then put your AI down in there. I've seen a lot of people do that. Um, so far for me, the BioCube light has been good for growing all the things like you can see pictured and I don't have a problem with it. So if, maybe if I was trying to go like with an SPS setup and I would increase my flow and I would put a, you know, a much better light on, on there. But for anything you're gonna try to grow soft corals and leathers and mushrooms and that kind of stuff, this light's gonna do absolutely fine. I mean, I grow zoas like crazy. Even Monte Pora in my tank does absolutely fine in Hollywood summer and stuff like that. So we are gonna go ahead and do this light in here. The only reason that I would ever change mine is if it broke and I could not get a replacement. So for 150 bucks, something like that, if you ever did anything to fry this light or the diodes, you can just buy the, the whole LED plate and replace it. So we'll go up there and set the timer on this thing. Some people have a hard time with it. It's a pretty self-explanatory timer, but if you've never used an aquarium timer before, or a light timer, then you may not know what's going on with that. So we're gonna do that right now. So this is the top of your bio cube, and it has simple on off. If, if you just decide, hey, I'm doing something right now, I don't want my light on, um, that's just going to turn it off. When you turn it back on, it's going to pick right up where your schedule is, as long as your your time is correct. So on here, if you all you have is up down, um, which just is going to change your, it's going to tell you right now since I'm not in set mode, it's just going to tell me what my current settings are. 
basically. If you hit menu, that's when you go into changing it. So I can go to 12 hour or 24 hour, and then set the current time. And then from there, this is gonna set your number one, which is your first setting, is your bright white light. So you wanna choose times for that light where it's gonna be, for me, on mine, I have it set for four hours. So I pick the middle four hours out of my total eight and set that white light for that. Then I set the outside of those hours for to have my dull white light, which is the second setting on here, at six hours. And it runs congruent with the, the bright light. So they're on at the same time. So we will look at this. So our first setting is gonna go from six to 10. So that'll give us four hours of bright white light. So 6 p.m. So that's when she will be near her tank. Most likely to 10. So that makes our light, our bright white be on for those hours. So number two is our dull white light. So if you're trying to build a ramp, you want your light to slowly come on like as most people want and should, then your best way is to set your bright white light on the hours just outside of that. So if our other light comes on at six, I'm gonna have the bright white light come on at five, the dull white light come on at five. So it'll be an hour before the bright white, and then it will stay on all the way until 11. So it's, it, it, so now your bright white turns off at 10, so for another hour, you're gonna have a dull white light. And then that takes us to number three, which is your just blue. This is only blue light. So you want this to be on for the longest amount of time. So we're gonna turn this one on at four, and it's gonna turn off at midnight. So now, since we're not inside those times at all yet, it's only 325, we don't have any light on in the tank. It's just, it's just gonna be off from midnight until this time. So for, so for now, I'm gonna go to that first setting, just for the purposes of making this video and keeping the light on. I'm gonna change our number one back to where it starts at three. And now when I click all the way through, when I get to the end, it's gonna pop on. So that's all it takes for setting your lights. I would, that's how I've set all of the, mine and all of the previous bio cubes up. And all of those corals in those tanks are doing absolutely fine. I would only ever change it if I started to notice there was an issue or I purchased some kind of coral that takes maybe a long, a longer light or higher par or something. I might, I might change something there, but I have not yet needed to do so. So the way that we set this tank up is obviously with live rock and sand. We also use the established water from our coral frag rack. So our giant rack that's in the center of the store has a huge 150 gallon or better sump in there. And we set all of our tanks up with water from that tank. So I know there's a lot of arguments, a lot of people that'll say, well, there's no reason to use used water because bacteria doesn't live in there and it doesn't stay in the water column and all this good stuff. Uh, I understand where people are coming from when they say this and they've heard this a million times. From our personal experience, using water that's established, for if for no other reason, then we dose that water. We constantly make sure that it's balanced as well as it can be. So starting with water that's already balanced and not brand new is not only going to help you not deal with your algae issues or your balancing issues, but your your tank is ready to go much faster than water that you just just made today and poured in there. Um, I have done an actual test with four buckets of water where they're brand new buckets. They all had exactly the same amount of water in them. Um, and then Basically, we set each one up a little differently, where the first bucket was brand new water and brand new media. The second bucket was brand new water and no media. The third bucket was old water, so used water, like taken out of a running aquarium, and new media. And then the final bucket was brand new water, but it had used media. So we took the actual filtration out of a tank and put it in the bucket. And both of the buckets that had used product in them, whether it was established water, as we call it, or established media, 
Both of those were cycles in six days, where I was pouring ammonia in at night, straight pure ammonia, and bringing it up to like five parts per million, and then leaving, and then by the next morning when I walked in and tested it, there was no ammonia in the buckets. The other two buckets with brand new water and brand new media, both of those buckets, after two weeks or three weeks, I gave up because they had not cycled. Every night, I could put the proper amount of drops to bring them all to the same parts per million in ammonia, and every day, the bucket that had the used water and the bucket that had the used media were good to go the next morning, and every single day, those other two still had ammonia in them. So if you want to go through the long, tedious process of cycling brand new water and dealing with all these algae issues, then by all means, you can do that and you'll have a pest-free aquarium when you, when you finally get past all those problems. If you just use water from an established tank, whether it comes from your LFS, if, you, if it's a clean LFS and you know all the fish are healthy, all the corals look good, and you know that their practices are good, then get your water from them. If you know a friend or you go out on Facebook and try to find somebody who's an established reefer that has good water that will give you 30, 60, 100 gallons of water, however much you need, then great, get some water from somebody who has a healthy reef with, you know, that it, does, it doesn't look like it's full of pests. If you can tell that their reef is healthy and they put good, a good amount of time, money into their, and effort into their aquarium, then your, their water's gonna be fine. You're gonna cycle your tank way faster than if you just, well, I'm just, I'm just gonna buy some stuff off the internet, build some new water and pour it in there because I read it on some form. Like bottom line is we do this all the time. I mean, we set up aquariums constantly and this is how we always do them. When a maintenance client buys a tank, say a reefer 350, we go into their house, we set it up with water from our tank with live rock and live sand, and then we use Turbo Star. We put in a bottle of Turbo Star every single one. And then sometimes we use Bio Nutribac from Sarah, but we give that two weeks. So our maintenance is every two weeks, like clockwork. And when we come back on that second week, we bring some coral, we bring some cleanup crew, and maybe a couple of fish. And then from there, every two weeks, we bring a little bit more stuff until their tank looks like a full blown reef. And we never ever have had one that we set up that was not good to go in two weeks with this system. Now I have had plenty that I've set up and tried to set up in some other manner and it's taken me a month or better of headaches to get it to cycle. But I don't ever have that problem whether it's fresh water, salt water, fish or reef, where if I set it up with established water and established media, that problem never happens. You are pretty much good to go out the gate because you're just duplicating the tank that you're getting these stuff from. So if that's already cycled, there's no reason that this would not be cycled, ready to go. So try to use that as, you know, your formula when you set up your tank and give it a shot. If you know you're gonna set up a tank and you set it up other ways in the past, just try this way. What's it gonna hurt? You set it up, if it doesn't cycle and it takes, and it's, so for some reason it doesn't work, which I've not ever seen it not work, then you're, still gonna be in the same place you were prior to starting it with the, with the used water. So give it a chance, see how it goes before you bash it. And don't believe just everything that you read in a forum on Reef to Reef. Those are just normal hobbies. You, if just because something works for one person, doesn't mean it's gonna work for every person. And when you, when you go into a forum, you have somebody who has one tank they've worked with for even 15 years. They have one tank. Their scope of view is very small. They, what their knowledge is of working knowledge is of their one tank, which is one biome they have. That is their experience. When you're working with a fish store who has done that tens of thousands of maintenance visits on every different kind of tank from a bio cube to a 600 to a 1,000, 1,200 gallon tank, then we're working on a scope that's much larger. We know it works on a large scale. So if if it's something that we do and we do it all the time and we're successful in a five-star company, there's probably something to that. So you can go online and argue with somebody all day long, they'll argue other points, but you know, we have plenty of experience and proof to back up that you should just use established water. If for nothing else, then you don't believe that my that BioMedia is alive in there, is just because we dose it all the time. It's not brand new water, it's been dosed, it has the right amount of alkalinity, calcium, magnesium already out the gate. So that's, bottom line, that's enough reason to start your apartment with good water.
Let's move on to uh, the dosing. So a lot of people will come in, they'll set up a, a tank, and they know nothing about dosing. Nobody tells them for some reason that they should be dosing their tank. So uh, you know, six, eight weeks down the line, they put they bought a bunch of coral, and they see what your tanks look like in the store, and then they come back and they go, "Well, I set up my tank just like yours, but all of my corals are dying, or my." Montipora is just bleached out and I can't figure out what's going on. You test their water and their alkalinity is like six and their calcium is like 300. And you're like, hey, um, how often do you dose? And they, all the time, people look at me and they're like, uh, what do you mean by dose? And that's a big problem if you've been running a reef tank for two months and you have a thousand dollars worth of coral in it. You should definitely be dosing. So our dosing regimen is a six part. It's bright well and we just white label it. It's um, calcium, magnesium, alkalinity, iodide, stronium, and essential trace. So calcium, magnesium, alkalinity are the building blocks for coral. Whether it has a skeleton or not, it needs those elements just to build more of itself, basically. So if you're not dosing those, they're being consumed, but you're not putting them back. It's just like in a planted aquarium. Well, oftentimes people buy plants, and they think they're just gonna be able to throw in their aquarium, and they don't put thought into well, the substrate that they're using is not planted substrate, so there's no nutrient in it. So their roots have nothing nothing to consume. And on top of that, they're not re-putting in the minerals and the elements that the plants are consuming. So six months, they're like, hey, uh, no, that's fine, you guys. You don't need all that stuff. They go on the internet. They tell everybody about how good their plants are doing and how you don't need to have a, 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 like a planted substrate and you don't need to dose and spend all your money on this stuff. But then six, nine months in, when their plants aren't doing so hot because they've already consumed all those elements out of the water. Now they start to die back and they start to look like crap. And these people think like, oh, I just don't, I'm just bad at, at growing plants. And it's, it's no, you're just not dosing them. You're not giving them their elements back. It's all consumed out of the water. The only thing that they're getting is what you add from, the, from your tap water. And I don't know how much potassium is in your tap water, but it's probably not enough to grow your plant. So be dosing, that goes the same for corals and plants. So those are your first three elements, calcium, magnesium, alkalinity. The other three, you have iodine and strontium, which one is for, it helps uh, reduce skeletal rejection, um, puts elements back in the water that are lost from skimming, things like that. If, if you're not skimming, then that one's not gonna be nearly as important, but you should have a skimmer. It's on like 99% of saltwater aquarium. So you probably need to be putting strontium back in there. And then, uh, the other helps for invertebrates. So you should have cleanup crew. Um, even if you don't, like you probably are gonna have some kind of shrimp in there, snails, anything that is eating algae probably falls into this category. And it helps them with shell building or molting, things like that. So you're gonna want to be dosing these things. They're not necessarily just for the coral. And it's not necessarily something that you are gonna be able to see like, oh, I'm not putting enough iodide in here because his shell's not growing properly. Those are not things that generally people are going to notice, but when you notice that your cleanup crew is living much longer, you're not having to add new snails and new crabs every three months, that's going to be part of it. If you're not doing it now, go ahead, start dosing strontium and iodide, and you'll notice a boost in your cleanup crew. They're going to live longer, they're going to look better. And then essential trace are essential elements that your fish that your fish consume. So better slime coats, um, scale reproduction, things like that. It's just a conglomerate of elements that help fish build better uh, scales and slime coat. So all of our elements are broken up into six parts. And a lot of people look at that and they say, well, now I have to add capfuls of six different chemicals three times a week. But you're already feeding your fish and we as hobbyists generally find something cathartic about having an aquarium anyway and taking care of it and making it do better. So you can you can buy a doser, something that will dose those things automatically for you, or you can you know add a couple of cap bowls three times a week and all of your stuff is gonna be healthier. It's not much of an added tax. It's like if you're gonna feed your fish every day like you should anyway, just go ahead and add some dosing in there. And it's not that big of a deal. You're just look at it as you're adding food for your corals if that's what you need to think of it as. Um, 
You can get all in ones. You can use other elements by all means. Red Sea has their own. It's it's a three part, so uh, they mix some of the other three elements besides calcium, and alkalinity into their into their uh, element structure. Now they do have separate bottles that you can buy of just that one element, um, but they do incorporate some of those things into their three part. Now, and you do have like all fruit, which is an all-in-one element dosing from Tropic Marin. My only problems with these are, is in, in theory, uh, an all-in-one would be great because you, it's dosing the same amount of calcium, magnesium, and alkalinity all the time. They're like a one for one. But if you have any issue in your tank where you have um, something that is causing more calcium than you require, like, uh, like a dead spot in the tank. So your alkalinity is crashing and your calcium is, is boosting. Well, now you're going to have to stop dosing your calcium and increase your alkalinity until you find that problem and resolve it. But until then, if you're using an all-in-one, you're just adding more and more and more calcium constantly because you don't have the ability to, to break those up. So we have them separated so I can test them individually and say, okay, well, for some reason, I have a dead spot or I have a, too much CO2 is building up in the top. Maybe my, I put my tank in a basement and CO2 is too heavy so it can't get out. So I need to increase, I need to incorporate a fan in my lid. But until you figure that out, you're going to be able to, with Brightwell's system, you're going to be able to just dose, stop dosing calcium altogether and only dose alkalinity to help bring those numbers to an even point. In a perfect world, you'd be able to add one cap full of both and your numbers are going to stay right at 425 for calcium and 9.5 for calcium for alkalinity. But that's not the way all of our tanks work. All of our tanks are different. They're all in different houses. They all have different airflow and water flow. So that is why we have them separated. So on our, I'll put links to everything that I use down in the description, but on our system, they each have a basic instruction on their, on their label. So calcium, magnesium, alkalinity say, dose one cap full or five milliliters per 25 gallons three to four times a week so that basically just it's basically saying if you have a lot of corals you're going to want to dose it like four times a week if you only have a couple and you're you don't have a whole lot that's consuming those elements dose it three times a week so there is a little bit of like kind of guesswork in there if you're really trying to have a successful reef where your corals are growing and you're able to frag them give them away or sell them or trade them in or whatever the case may be, you really want to see all of your stuff thriving, you're going to want to test. Like, test your test your stuff so you know what it is. If you're just one of like, hey, I'm a lazy reefer and I just want to have this thing do as much as it can by itself and I want to do just a little bit of work, follow the rules on the label, maybe take it into your LFS, have them test it once a month or whatever, and then you can kind of adjust, all right, I'll dose a little less of this for the next month, whatever the case may be. As long as your corals are alive and they're healthy, and that's all you worry about, then you can probably get away with not testing all the time. So just go off of what the label says. You know, Red Sea is gonna tell you, using this much of this product will increase your alkalinity by this much. So if you're using Red Sea's product, they're not gonna give you just a generalization. You can guess, guess it, but that's gonna be more dangerous. Um, but with Brightwell, you can pretty much say, this is roughly where you should be if you had all the right flows and temperatures and all that good stuff. So you can get kind of close off of what's on the bottle. I mean, I've seen people have successful reef tanks that have not tested literally for years and they just go off of making sure their salinity and temperature is right and they dose off of those bottles. So that is something that you can do. Um, and then only test when you see there's an issue. Oh, hey, I can tell that there's like, my Monte Coros don't look very good. Or hey, all of my, um, Zoas are not coming out. So you can start to then, oh, hey, maybe I should probably go get my water tested and figure out what's going on. Then you find out that your alkalinity is a six because you've been dosing reef nutrition and it's been dropping. So those are just kind of the basics of what you're going to get into in setting up, up a saltwater aquarium. The very bottom line is set it up with, with one pound per gallon sand and rock um, use established water if you can get a hold of it. Make sure you have a, a good flow pump. Um, if you notice that there's dead spots in your aquarium after a few days or weeks where there's stuff that's piling up that's not going down the filter, 
add another power head in there and get, get that stuff circulating around. The only way that waste can go out is if it stays waterborne so that it goes into the thumbstick. Um, make sure you get a good heater, like the Eheim heater mentioned. Um, they will, when they fail, they, so far for us, I'm sure someone's had it happen. When they fail, they fail off. So you're not gonna boil your aquarium. Like wake up in the middle of the night and your aquarium's been stuck on all night long and everything is dead because it's 95 degrees and your heater never shut off. We haven't had that problem with these yet. We have had them when they fail, just be off. And so somebody tests their water and their water 72 degrees, it's very cold, but your corals are definitely gonna deal with that a lot better than being 90. Like they may recede or have some problems if your water gets too cold, but if it gets too hot, it will die. Um, just like if you have an alkalinity event, if you, if you pour a half bottle of alkalinity in there by accident, you're probably gonna lose a lot of stuff. So keep good um, chemical control, watch your temperature and your salinity, and that's that's basically the gist of it. Keep your light at eight hours, keep your cleanup crew in there. We have a formula that we run um, in the store when people come in, we say, hey, look, this is what you should have. And it has everything from how many starfish, how many crabs, how many snails you should have per gallon in your aquarium to keep it as clean as possible with as little of your effort as you can. And you will know, like we know in the, in the store on the um, display tanks, when we start seeing things, we know, hey, I don't think there's enough hermit crabs in here. And then you get looking around and go, oh, we definitely neglected that. There's not enough hermit crabs in here. That's why we have tufts of algae. So we go grab a handful of hermit crabs, chuck them in there, guaranteed in the next three days, all those problems are gone. So if you keep your cleanup crew maintained properly, you're gonna have a lot less headaches, in just entirely, way less headaches. The less algae I've grown in there, the less you have opportunity for for it to grab onto stuff to hold on to, like detritus and waste and just stuff that should be once again waterborne. So keep your cleanup crew up. Even in a tank that you have that has a sump, all of this stuff still applies. We still use all that same filter parts we use in a the sump. They just go inside of a sock, um, like a filter sock. So Red Sea has filter socks, Continuum has filter socks. You have down pipes that go into those socks. It's like a fine mesh filter that catches as much large part waste as it can. So we shove uh, Purigen and Polyfilter in there with like some bio, bio cubes basically, uh, like export NO3 PO4 cubes from Brightwell into those socks. And then from there it goes into your skimmer chamber and then onto your refugium and then into your pump chamber. And pumps back up and does all exactly the same things. So we use all these same parts. We just won't use a 500 gallon per hour power head, we'll use a 1200 or 2000, 3000 gallon per head power heads. We use multiple, just depending on the size of the tank. So if you take all of these rules and just expand them to a larger aquarium, you'll still be as successful as all the things pictured in all the tanks that you can see if you look on the store or on our website. So um, outside of that, get a good scraper. BioCube actually has their own scraper that has a curve for this curved piece of glass here. Uh, when you're cleaning your aquarium, especially you need to keep track of it when you have a solar aquarium because you probably have sand. If you get down to the bottom of your substrate and you get sand caught, uh, I don't know if you can see that little bit of sand in there, but if I continue to, to scrape this glass, with that sand in there right there, I will scratch this aquarium so badly you won't want to look at it. Anymore. So when that happens, before you use a scraper, one, feel and make sure that you don't feel any edges on this stuff that are sharp because I've seen even the plastic from a bent scraper or like a nick in a metal scraper handle that will destroy the side of an aquarium. Let it go, inspect it. If you see sand in there, get it out of there. You, don't, you don't want to be actively, so I'll use like this magnet turned to the side. So I don't have the magnet up against the glass. So it's just barely teetering this magnet up to the top where she wants to fall. In her tank, this is kind of what you have. Because it's so tall, it's up on this giant stand. So get it to the top, knock all the sand, knock all the sand out of it. 
and then put it back and continue to clean. If you get sand on there, you don't want to keep going. Keep an eye on it. If you have somebody else watching your tank, warn them about these things because oftentimes people will go out of town and have somebody watch their tank and somebody will think they're doing a good thing and being helpful. They want to help you by cleaning your aquarium and then they put some just giant scratches in it because they really just don't know anything. On the outside of the glass, we generally would use alcohol. Um, it evaporates quickly and doesn't leave streaks. So if you do have salt on the outside, like we've got some here from dripping down from setting it up, you're gonna wanna wipe the salt off with a paper towel first, and then go ahead and spray some alcohol or some whatever your cleaning agent is onto the paper towel, and then clean the glass with it. Don't spray it onto the glass. The last thing you want is for Windex to get sucked into here or lemon pled, whatever crazy thing you're gonna use. I've seen people ask crazy stuff like, can I use mineral spirits or paint thinner and stuff like that to like clean my aquarium glass? And it's like, I don't know why you'd ever do that, but please just don't do that. Like, I get the craziest questions that I saw on Facebook, I can use this to clean my aquarium. Just don't do it. Just, just don't. Use a little bit of alcohol, even if you're gonna use some Windex, spray it into the towel and then clean your aquarium. If you use too much, you'll get streaks. If you have too much salt on here, you'll just spread the salt and wipe around and you'll get streaks just like, you may not be able to see them in the video, but there are now salt streaks across here from me using that um, scraper without cleaning the glass first. So that's also a problem. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for my ranting today on the saltwater aquarium. Uh, it is a saltwater, of course. But. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for my ranting today. Ask a local fish store for, for help or support. Um, go on to Reef Tarif. There's a lot of good information on there. However, there is there are still a lot of users that, like I said, have a very small field of view. So take that into consideration. If you're going to do that, kind of crowdfund an idea and see what you get the most answers for. You can always call us over at Glass Aquatics and we'll help you out and give you as much um, good information as we know to exist. We don't ever talk about stuff we don't know. If I don't know an answer, I'll just tell you I don't know and I have to research it. So always kind of try to go with people that have that idea. If they know it all, all the time, they probably don't. So keep that in mind. We do a live stream every Tuesday at 6.30 where we take corals from our frag rack and we re greatly reduce the price. So if they're a $45 frag, they're probably 30 in the live stream, 30 is 20. Um, we have whole colonies recently had a bounce mushroom it's like $400, we had it on there for a hundred bucks off. So uh, check us out over at uh, Glass Aquatics Live on Facebook, that's the group. If you join, uh, we use comment sold. So it's just a matter of, uh, hey, sold 34, sold 25. And that puts it in your cart and you can check out that way. It's that easy. First come, first serve on whatever coral may be up there. I've got a trailer for that. I will put it in the description. I will also put a link to all of the products that I have on there, um, along with pictures and descriptions. And then anything else or any questions you guys have, give us a call, type them in the comments below. Let us know what other kind of setups you want to see, um, product reviews, any of that kind of good stuff. And if you could comment, subscribe, that would be very helpful. And I look forward to setting up another aquarium for you soon.